So at this point, I will hand over to Buddy. I hope, Buddy, you've had a chance to have a look at any questions that you might have received there, and uh, I invite you to respond to any of those that are there. So over to you, Buddy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the first question is regarding what we call as intimidation or reprisal regarding what we are doing. I think uh, Brian has mentioned about that issue. And indeed, uh, for me personally, is I do receive some uh, uh, what I presume as act of reprisal against uh, me uh, through my family. Uh, therefore, I, for the moment, I cannot go back to Indonesia because of the, uh, my situation. But it doesn't mean that we uh, should not continue to work on that issue because I think it, it's quite important uh, really for us to bring the mandate of the people in uh, raising the concerns. Uh, regarding uh, what the government has done, uh, the second question, what the government has done uh, with the letter, uh, first, of course, not of course, but for the context of the Indonesian government, there's a denial. No, I think uh, the first reaction uh, by the Indonesian government was by saying that there is no such a thing as indigenous peoples in Indonesia. They don't recognize the notion of indigenous peoples as uh, it is explained in the UN Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People. The Indonesian government indeed has a certain definition of uh, the indigenousity of the people by saying that everyone is indigenous people. So. Uh, however, there is a, a, a draft law on the, uh, the, the legal indigenous community in which the recognition should be done through a legal recognition by the government, which is against uh, the spirit of the uh, UN Declaration of the Right Indigenous People. So we are working on that uh, as well through different mechanisms just to uh, really put pressure to the Indonesian government uh, at the international level, as well as the associations of the indigenous people in Indonesia, so that at one day there should be a change in, in the Indonesian legal system in which the indigenous people status can be recognized uh, according to the UN Declaration of the Right of Indigenous People. So there are some challenges, there are some uh, uh, hurdles. But I think uh, we trying as much as possible to uh, continue working despite those difficulties. Thank you. Thanks, Buddy. Okay, I think I'll now hand over to Steve. I'm not sure if you've got some questions there, Steve, but uh, I invite you to respond any, to any that are there. Thank you. Uh, so Felicia has asked whether it's costly. Actually, COVID has done us good uh, has done us good because uh, we uh, could do all these consultations online and we do have a staff that works with children's parliaments and they could use this as a tool to engage young people so where expenses were concerned it wasn't really an added expense uh, given that we didn't do on-ground consultations the same but if we were to move into on-ground on it could be quite and quite a, a challenge uh, given that uh, India is such a huge country. Uh, sorry for that. The other question was on long term and short term. Uh, we consider it to be a long term engagement because we don't see it as just a report. I mentioned it's got it's kind of a mandate for us for the next five years. It's got to be we've got to take this now to embassies. We'll be taking it to our ministries. We'll be taking it to the UN bodies. Uh, we'll also be taking it to grassroots bodies as well. So we're looking at this as certainly as long term and uh, we've got to be more engaged with the midterm review and the tracking of it uh, throughout the, the years. I think those are the two questions, Brian. Okay, thanks, Steve. We, we have um, a number of minutes left. So what we'd like to do is to offer the opportunity to any of you, our participants, to share your experience of using any of the UN mechanisms that we've talked about today. Or perhaps maybe you just want to share any learnings or takeaways that you found particularly helpful from today. So we'll initially limit you to a couple of minutes. Um, so if you'd like to speak, just click the raise your hand button, which is in the reactions uh, um, uh, section at the, at the bottom of the screen and then uh, we'll invite you to, to, to speak. So Felicia, I see your hand raised. Would you care to uh, speak? You have the floor. You'll need to unmute.
You, we still can't hear. You need to unmute that. No, you're right. Okay. Over yeah, to you, okay. Felicia. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't allowing me to unmute for a while there. Um, uh, my question is not really about any of the things that you have mentioned, but maybe it's something which uh, is dear to my heart, and I would like to see if there's something that can be done through this forum. And what it is, is it's <clears throat> about the Ukraine and how all of the, the uh, big countries are uh, avoiding trying to do anything about the uh, closing the skies to Russia. And yet I feel I, I'm not a, a high, high technology person, but I would have thought that there would be a way of closing down part of the Russian satellites, which would stop them being able to uh, make airstrikes. And uh, I, I just wonder if there's anybody in, in the UN that can take that up and see, is, is that possible? Or is that outside the whole range of the UN uh, mechanisms that you're working with? Thank you. So any of our panelists want to respond to that? Or, I mean, I suppose my, my comment is it's, it's probably a, at a different level to NGOs. I mean, uh, there's certainly um, a very great concern at the international level among countries who, who uh, are trying to address the terrible situation there. But um, we, we are actually um, co-signed a statement about the situation in, in Ukraine that was delivered in this Human Rights Council session. But that's probably about the extent to which uh, we can become involved. It's really, it seems to me, at a much higher level than uh, uh, NGOs can really uh, do much about. But maybe Buddy might have something to add to that. Uh, yeah, I uh, would like to agree with you, uh, Brian, that the issue with the UN is not, uh, the, the limitation of the UN, UN is not a supra nation. You know, uh, UN uh, is based on the members. And as you know, the only UN body that has uh, the capacity to impose decision is the Security Council. And as you know very well, uh, that within the Security Council, you have the five prominent members that have the veto right. Therefore, uh, the efforts of the UN Security Council to uh, adopt resolutions uh, on the situation in, in, in Ukraine has been blocked, not only by Russia, but also by China. So that is the, the limitations of the, the, the UN that we have at the moment, so that there is no strong resolutions within the Security Council. Having said that, the uh, UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution, very strong resolution uh, regarding the situation in, in Ukraine, as well as the Human Rights Council. But those two resolutions are non-legally binding. It means that they cannot impose those two resolutions so that the situation that Russia leave uh, Ukraine. It's very unfortunate. And having said that as well, if you have the opportunity to see as well how many states that fought, uh, that voted for the resolution and against the resolution or in abstention. Uh, some of the countries, they even do not want to join uh, most of the nations to condemn Russia. So that's also very sad, either in the, security, in the General Assembly or in the Human Rights uh, uh, Council. So it means that there's no anonymity, uh, there's no uh, how to say, unified uh, force within the UN member states in condemning the situation. So we have to take into consideration those uh, uh, reality. However, I think the message is very strong, either from the member, most of the member states or the civil society to condemn what's happening in, in, in Ukraine. So that's my uh, view. Thanks, buddy. Anyone else like to make a comment? Ask a question, share an experience. I see a question from Greta. What are going to be psychological repercussions of COVID two years closing of schools? Any data or comment? Anyone like to respond to that?
I know that in India, the UNICEF have done a, a number of, of uh, uh, studies on this. So, uh, Gita, I'll get back to you on sending you some more data on that. I don't have it on, on tips of my finger at the moment, but I know they, uh, they have had a number of studies done on this particular aspect. Um, we have a question from Pauline. How will the UN protect a member who is speaking out the truth and feels insecure? Can I say something on that? That's uh, pretty. Yeah, it, 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 it is. Uh, I mean, the UN put some efforts in trying to protect the, the human rights uh, uh, defenders in danger or uh, those who uh, are uh, victims of reprisals. So there is a specific mechanism within the UN in which the government, uh, the UN will uh, write a, a report on the list of people uh, uh, experiencing intimidation. That report is issued by the UN General Assembly. So when the, the names of those people are made public, so that can provide a little bit uh, more layer of protections of the person. However, UN is not, uh, as you know, UN is not the police of the, uh, uh, the, the world. So the UN cannot take uh, concrete actions in trying to provide uh, physical support. In some uh, cases in which if the, the life of a person is really in imminent danger, the UN can provide uh, uh, facilities in trying to uh, bring that people, that person uh, outside the zone of danger. So there are some instances like that uh, in which uh, the, the person, uh, the human rights defenders that is really in imminent danger can be taken uh, through, uh, or facilitated by the UN to a safe space. But at the same time, uh, as you know that uh, the UN also has what they call what we call as the uh, human right, the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, in which is a kind of a legal protection or uh, the guidelines on uh, the need of the protection, legal protections for the human rights defenders that will uh, force the states to respect uh, the human rights defenders and not to attack human rights defenders while they are uh, doing uh, the work. I don't know if it is very clear, but uh, in uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are some mechanisms, but still this mechanism sometimes is not very uh, uh, real in the real life of people uh, receiving the threat. But there are some mechanisms in trying to, uh, uh, to protect them by sending messages to the government. We know that if this or this person is in danger, we keep an eye and we will not be very, very happy if you harm them. Okay. Thanks, buddy. We've got any other comments or questions? Anyone else like to speak? Raise your hand in the reactions button if you if you have. It makes it simpler to identify you. I might just add one other comment that's, that's, that's probably a little bit of a side issue, but one of, one of, I think, the really unfortunate consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is it's distracted the world from, uh, I think, what's even a more serious threat that uh, our planet is facing, and that's uh, uh, the whole issue of what's happening to our climate. And um, just last month, the International Panel on Climate Change uh, released another interim report, which uh, uh, is really disturbing, really frightening. And yet um, uh, the world is distracted by what's happening in the Ukraine and, and, and uh, that, that runs the risk of, of delaying action. So I just put that comment out there too. I see Anthony Kaka, uh, Dacker has uh, uh, raised his hand. So Anthony, if you could unmute and uh, ask your question or make your comment. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, the question goes to Steve. I just wanted to know how does he communicate uh, to the uh, nation? Because he said that uh, some of the questions that uh, the kids ask in parliament are somehow edited or tailored? No, 
two forums in parliament. One is edited when the vice president of India presides. The other is informal because you have opposition parties there. And therefore, the children are, are freer to ask even the tricky questions because some political party will back what they're saying. Uh, yeah, so one is a very formal session, the other is informal, but we also have more informal gatherings and interactions with, uh, with members of parliament and members of legislative assemblies and local administrative bodies at different forums. So it, uh, you've also got to be able to pitch which issue you're going to bring up with which MP based on their political lineage. Anthony. Okay, thank you, Richard. But thanks, Steve. Maybe I could respond to Mary's question there. Uh, the strategy we use in India is to bring a coalition together to write reports. So when the WGHR came together, there's hundreds of NGOs uh, writing that report, and you don't know particularly which NGO is behind a particular comment. So that's been one strategy we've used. And the other strategy that Brian mentioned is to use NGOs abroad to take up the more contentious issues that we can't raise here in India. Maybe to respond to the questions of the sister. Uh, yeah, Philippines is going to be examined by the UBR uh, very soon. The deadline is going to be at uh, the end of this month, together with some other countries like uh, India and Indonesia as well. So indeed, uh, and we know very well that the situation of human rights defenders in the Philippines is really a danger. Uh, we will deliver a statement uh, as Transnational International tomorrow on that issue. Um, what I think would suggest is that if you think that there is a possibility of uh, uh, reprisals or impact on you, you can also make a submissions without mentioning uh, uh, the name of your congregation or your organization. So this is exactly what uh, uh, Brian has mentioned that uh, some of us, uh, some religious congregation or some NGOs having presence in, in Myanmar, we uh, ask Brian, we ask Edmund Rice International that has kindly extended their good heart to read the statement because precisely we are afraid of having a repercussion. Uh, we had two uh, FMM sisters coming uh, two weeks ago to Geneva and we did some lobby here and there, but they were really under uh, the, uh, uh, how to say, confidential uh, arrangement because uh, the most important uh, thing is that not, on, not that our name will appear, but also the, the issue is addressed. So I think for the UPR uh, submissions, try to think about what can be the possibility? Otherwise, you can also be the silent, let's say, the silent supporters of that GBR. And some of the lay NGO, they will be uh, brave enough to put their names uh, uh, up front. But if you think that your community can be uh, 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 intimidated afterward, maybe it's good also to put a little bit of low profile on that. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Any more questions, comments? I see Kevin has made a, uh, Kevin Corley has made a, a comment there. Do you want to speak to that, Kevin? Hi, good morning from New York. Yes, uh, I made I entered two items in the uh, chat. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the ERI uh, Energies for pushing out this uh, kind of a program. And I'm uh, thanking uh, Buddy in particular and Steve, who I know, uh, for your efforts. I'm also sorry to hear, Buddy, about your family and difficulty and the, your, own, your own problems of, uh, you know, your government, the government of Indonesia pushing back. It's it's all well and good for me to stay here in uh, New York and the safety of this part of the world and speak about these things, but I think it requires a tremendous more, uh, a great more courage uh, from people like yourself and Stephen to speak up. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. 
Uh, the the resolution on uh, uh, the go back to the question originally about the Ukraine, the General Assembly did uh, pass a resolution, as you noted, that's not legally binding, but uh, it was interesting to see that 90 countries co-sponsored that resolution. 141 voted in favor of the resolution to condemn the Russian invasion. Five voted against, you can guess who they are. But interesting enough, 35 countries abstained. They were too afraid to even say yes or no on that question. So it's it's an indication, I think, to all of us that this is a, a fraught world and there's tremendous pressures on all these governments to uh, not put their foot wrong in terms of uh, global uh, politics. So that's one more reminder, I think, of the value of the UN and it's, uh, it does expose the fault lines and lets us know uh, how to proceed uh, very carefully here so that uh, we don't do more damage. Uh, there are some good things happening. I have noted them in the chat. There is a, pr a process going forward now about the law of the sea. Uh, that uh, kind of work is always ongoing, but it's, it's, I think, reassuring to know that there are people, even as we are working here this morning, who are working on how to save uh, the oceans, trying to come up with... Uh, legally binding instruments at some point. And then at the same time, this horrendous scourge of plastic that's destroying the place, uh, particularly the oceans. Uh, there is a, a draft treaty coming forward on uh, the use of plastics, and that will be a global agreement. That's again in the beginning stages, but we are working on it. And I, I echo Brian's comments that yes, the invasion of Ukraine has distracted everybody from the, the super, as we say, the worst possible problem, which is the climate continues to warm, sea levels continue to rise. And we're very distracted now because the Ukraine crisis has pushed the climate crisis off the front pages. So it does, we do well to pay attention to that question, not to take our eyes off that concern. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kevin.